My name is Gabrielle Delve. I'm the Director of Brand Marketing here at Vendor, and I'll be your Logistics MC today. We are really excited to bring these four folks together to talk about innovations in tech and procurement. So thanks so much to Michelle Vita, Soren Page, and Wayne Williams for sitting down with our CEO, Ryan New, today. Thanks, Gab, and hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ryan New. I am the CEO and co-founder of Vendor. I'm based in Boston and just wanted to give some quick context as to why we are doing this today. One, we're super grateful for the speakers and panelists joining us. We've had the chance to work closely with them over the, the past uh, couple of years. And I think there's gonna be a lot of really cool information to share with everyone who's either looking to get into procurement, in procurement or curious about procurement. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of good stuff today. Um, but in terms of the why, so uh, Vendor actually launched our 2.0 product uh, very recently. This was over a year in the making and we're super, super excited about it. And we wanted to celebrate by bringing in some of the brightest minds in procurement to share their experiences with you. Um, so if you haven't checked out Vendor 2.0, shoot us a note, we'd love to show it to you. Um, and with that gab, should we introduce our panelists? Yeah, that's a great segue. You wanna take over uh, panelist intros? Perfect. Um, so today we've got Michelle Vita, uh, Senior Director of Procurement at Datadog. We've got Soren Page, Head of Procurement at Commerce Hub, and Wayne Williams, Director of Procurement at Active Campaign. So let's do a quick round of intros. Michelle, starting with you, um, how long have you been at Datadog? Where are you based? How big is your procurement team? And Icebreaker, what was your first concert? So um, I have been at Datadog for a little over three years, and I was the first procurement hire at the organization, so responsible for building out all the processes and the systems that we currently have in place today. So when I joined, there was really no um, strategic sense of procurement at the organization. It was mainly tactical, a lot of supplier ne negotiation to get you know discounts on contracts, but kind of ended there. Um, the team has built out over the three years to six people. Um, and that includes somebody that's actually starting this coming Monday, which we're super excited about. Um, you know, the team is split up into operations and then strategic sourcing, which we're starting to build out. And um, yeah, I'm based in Manhattan. I'm born and raised in New York, uh, which I'm finding is kind of a rare thing um, nowadays. But my first concert was Bruce Springsteen with my dad, and he's a huge fan of, you know, the boss and everything. It was actually at Shea Stadium before it was torn down, um, you know, and now it's it's City Field. But yeah, pretty cool concert to go Amazing. to the first one. Awesome. Setting the bar high, Springsteen <laughs> concert number one. Uh, Soren, what about you? Uh, where are you based? How long have you been at Commerce Hub? Size of a tournament team and first concert? Yeah, I'm based in the Columbus, Ohio area, and the uh, team's very small. Uh, I have one person di uh, directly reporting to me. I've managed teams as large as uh, 20 plus. Um, I've been at Commerce Hub uh, for a year now, um, but I bring uh, 10 years of finance experience plus another 12 of procurement experience. Uh, in terms of my first concert, it's actually also Bruce Springsteen, uh, but it was in East Berlin um, in the late 80s before the fall of the wall. Two for two. Wayne, wow, what about you? Crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I am based in Chicago, which is Active Campaign's global headquarters. Um, been with the company about a year and a half. Our department is uh, a mighty team of two, just me and one other. Um, and I am older, don't remember the first concert. So the most recent one was Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> nice. Nice. My first concert was Backstreet Boys, 13 years old, uh, followed by NSYNC. I had to chaperone my cousin there. So uh hit the ground running with the concerts all right um thanks for joining us all let's let's dive right into it and gab if you want to pull up on the screen the first question oh actually no why don't you set the stage for what we're talking about and then i'll, I'll kick it off the first question cool. cool yeah yeah i wanted to just give a quick overview of the topics we're planning on covering today um just so you know what the the questions will address um it's negotiation experiences and wins, modern day procurement improvements, the state of the economy, uh, procurement automation, and predictions for 2023. So no shortage of content here today. If there is anything that we're missing, uh, again, please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A tool, and we'll cover them towards the end of today's webinar. All right, 
I'm going to turn off my video. Ryan, the fireside chat is all yours. Beautiful. Thanks, Scott. All right, we're going to start with a fun one. So at Vendor, like we're obviously big fans of negotiating. And um, procurement people typically have a lot of experiences with negotiations as well. So what is one of like the biggest negotiation uh, or most memorable experiences from a negotiation uh, that makes you most proud or what is like the biggest one you've ever had in procurement from a negotiation perspective? Uh, and how did you do it? And Wayne, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, so most memorable is definitely a super big uh, BPO or business process outsourcing contract. Um, that was pretty hairy and uh you know the thing that i took away from it was um this concept of step in rights you know if you're outsourcing something especially in the technology arena you've got to remember to preserve your ability uh to take it back over if things don't go well and, I, and that was just a very memorable thing because it, it applies to everything even even cloud software you know if you're stepping into a solution one of the things you want to look for is is you know how would we end this if we decide to take a, a different strategic direction? Very interesting. Yeah, the end in mind. Uh, Soren, what about you? Yeah, so a few years ago when I worked at a, a $12 billion retailer, um, I helped uh, select a new email service provider um, and um, uh, supported that, that migration. So I included RP selection, negotiations, contracting uh, from an at-risk uh, legacy software provider to a Best in class platform. Um, and the program was huge. So, you know, the, the companies uh, under that umbrella send out over 30 billion uh, emails per year. So that's about 100 million emails per day. Uh, and I worked with eight marketing teams, five finance teams, several IT teams, and so forth. Um, why was it memorable? Not really because of the complexity, size, or the savings that we ultimately drove, but because of the learnings. Um, you know, I, I get to learn from a variety of IT and marketing partners really deeply what they cared about and how they made their decisions. Uh, secondly, I uh, learned to maneuver, uh, uh, you know, cross-functional decision uh, matrix uh, with various teams, just understanding what matters to them is not, you know, to one team doesn't necessarily matter to another. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, just co uh, was a very complex negotiation uh, covering business risk, data, uh, data, data privacy, security, and lots of uh, uh, legal T's and C's uh, that were fun. So I treasure uh, that because I uh, that that entire experience because I think that's when I became truly a, uh, a full fledged uh, procurement pr practitioner. Yeah, and it, you know the complexity of the negotiation extend far beyond what the dollars that could be saved, and oftentimes yeah. those are worth a heck of a lot more to an organization and, and your internal stakeholders. Uh, that's great, Michelle. What about you? I would say probably one of my more recent negotiations, which was about um, one of the trade shows that we were doing. It ended up coming in a lot over budget than we had expected, and it was really one of those situations okay. where you know, kind of like others were saying that procurement was really kind of uh, more of a strategic partner in the actual scope creation and going through line item by line item and sort of developing alternative approaches to some of the things that we were planning in order to save money. So just kind of being a fresh set of eyes on a scope and a budget so we can just make the best decisions as a company rather than you know, just saying, all right, like, let's go to the best and the top and let's just spend as much money as possible. We can probably scale back a little bit and still uphold the integrity of the event, um, but also save a ton of money. So it was something that, you know, happened to me very recently and still, still going through the process, but it's, it was a very memorable experience and really high savings came out of it. Amazing. So the power of being the trusted advisor. And again, it's not just about the savings. Super cool. Um, great. Well, and, and I'll actually share one of one of mine. So uh, at Vendor, we've had a lot of negotiations, but one of the most memorable for me is um, uh, I completed a negotiation. This is back when we were like a team of like two or three. I personally completed the negotiation, and within ten minutes, I got an email from the customer being like, "Wow, how the heck did you get those savings?" And then from the seller saying, "Wow, how did you close this so quickly?" And that really resonated with me because it was like the negotiation is actually about mutual wins um, and people have different objectives. So that was a fun one. Um, all right, let's go over to the second question. Um, so 
procurement as a function, it's evolved over the years. And there's obviously been the exponential growth of SaaS tools that's fueled much of that. So what would you say is one of the major um, improvements of modern day procurement? Michelle, let's keep with you. What do you think? Yeah, so kind of what I was saying earlier, I think that the way that it's evolved is that procurement is really becoming more of a strategic arm rather than, you know, kind of like a paper pusher, right? Or like a gatekeeper. I feel like procurement always gets the the bad reputation that we're kind of just here to say no and we're just here to save money. And I think that in general, it's kind of moved away from a very myopic approach of just obtaining discounts through supplier negotiation and more towards being, you know, a strategic player in the overall purchasing process, which of course includes all of these various groups involved in this process, all the way from, you know, vendor due diligence to the end of the process, which is invoice payment. And I think procurement really having ownership over the entire process and really thinking about the strategy when purchasing, it it just adds a lot more value to the organization than just saving a couple of dollars off a contract, right? Procurement has the really you know, procurement is privileged in the way that we kind of see everything that's happening at the company through this purchasing lens. So when things and needs arise, we're at least able to look at it as part of the overall ecosystem of what's happening in the company, rather than just this like software contract that we need to get the best price on. And we can just add a little bit of an element of strategy when purchasing, um, you know, rather than just saving a couple of bucks. And Michelle, going off of that, I mean, how have you been in an organization that's required from a change management perspective? Like, how do you educate the organization of like this greater purpose versus the perception or potential perception that it is more of like a paper pushing or negotiating role? Like, how do you actually go about the education and change management? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm going through right now. So, you know, like I said, when I started at the company, there was really nothing, nothing in place. So a lot of the work has been putting the foundation in place that we can actually get visibility into what's going on in the company, first and foremost, right? Now we're kind of doing this sort of roadshow where we're cluing people into the value that procurement can provide and that we can be a partner and we can actually take work off of their plate rather than be a gatekeeper or add all these hoops and, you know, bureaucracy that they need to deal with. It's really not that. We can actually take it off of your plate and make your day-to-day more of what you're here to do at the company, right? So like a marketing person that's putting together an event for, you know, for our customers, their day-to-day is, you know, calling these customers and dealing with them to see if they're actually coming, like, who are they going to have speak at the event? It's not going through, you know, a process of how to maneuver procurement and how to maneuver legal, like procurement can do all of that. So that's, it's, it's a long process to, it's a, it's a long process to do. It takes a lot of trust. Um, and it's just something that you need to build up the relationship and the rapport with the internal stakeholders and prove yourself that you can bring value and then kind of take it from there. And Wayne, we've spoken a lot about your view on on, uh, internal customers um, or internal stakeholders as customers. So what do you think about this question? Yeah, um, you know, essentially, um, we are a customer service team that just happens to deliver procurement services. Um, Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with everything that Michelle was saying. You know, we live to unburden other professionals on our team from from these functions so that they can be, you know, the best marketing team or the best sales team um, and best engineer. Um, and, and it's true. We, in that process, you become this nexus where you connect dots all across the organization and you can alert people, uh, you know, to potential collisions or, or duplication of services or products. Um, and it also leads to us kind of stepping outside of what I think people think is their t- traditional procurement role. You know, uh, you, there's a little bit of PMing in there and there's a, just a little bit of guidance that, you know, doesn't have to do with uh, contract redlining or negotiations, um, uh, but it, it's all value add at the end of the day. And Soren, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I completely uh, concur with uh, Michelle and Wayne uh, that you know procurement has to mature uh, from a buying function or has matured uh, from buying function to a strategic function with a 
you know, focus on delivering for our internal customers. Uh, I think that's uh, a really important uh, point, but there's, it's a journey, right? You're, just because you state that, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that's, that you're being viewed that way. Uh, so in addition to that, now we're also being asked uh, to automate and uh, create more predictable, but also flexible processes at speed. So there's that continuous evolution where the goalpost keeps moving out. Um, uh, and and uh, in addition to uh, the, the changing expectation from our internal uh, customers, uh, there are also other challenges, uh, you know, they're oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, business cycle focus, uh, external or internal, uh, that, you know, where, where it's all of a sudden like, hey, we need to dial for dollars kind of thing, gets in, could get in the way of automating or of finding the time to automate. So I think there's a, a, a healthy push-pull, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I do believe that, uh, you know, that focus on our, meeting our internal customer needs is key uh, with the strategic approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's going to stick with me. I, I like Wayne when you said we lived unburdened teams and, and connecting the dots. So um, let's move on over to the third question, which is um, also related. So all of those initiatives that the three of you were just spoke, uh, talking about, you need time in the day to be able to actually do those things like building your, your internal customer relationships versus uh, on the phone all day doing negotiations. And so um, procurement teams are historically... Um, uh, over or understaffed and overworked from a capacity perspective. So right now, uh, companies everywhere are being asked to do more with less, especially with an economic downturn. Uh, downturn. So what is one way that you've handled that challenge in the past six months? And Soren, why don't we start with you? Yeah, uh, it's a really challenging question. Um, we've focused our efforts uh, on creating more visibility and transparency. So we implemented uh, a workflow tool that gives uh, all of our internal customers and stakeholders a view uh, of the entire chain of approvals, uh, you know, where requests is at, um, what the conversation, uh, uh, you know, on that requests are and uh, how it's progressing. Uh, one key so insight for us um, uh, when we implemented uh, this, this workflow tool was to put the departmental approval and the finance approval at the very beginning of, of that approval flow, which uh, eliminated lots of late or, you know, some late discoveries of misalignment uh, or rush finance approvals. Uh, I believe that that's delivered a big win and not just for procurement, but also for, uh, for the stakeholder and, and for finance. Michelle, what about you? Well, one of the things that we've implemented recently actually was, um, you know, well, actually to take a step back, when I started to look at the things that my team was working on, I realized that a lot of it was sort of, you know, a little bit of hand-holding with internal stakeholders kind of, you know, maneuvering our systems and our processes, which tells me two things. It tells me one, I probably need to look at my systems and processes a little bit closely and make them a little bit more user-friendly, but two, I also want to get my team, you know, sort of out of that, right? So one of the things that we actually implemented recently were these um, self-guided user guides that are in our purchasing system. So it's kind of like back in the day when you use Microsoft Word and had that little paper clip that would pop up and say like, hey, do you need help? So it kind of pops up on the side and it says, you know, oh, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to submit a con? contract? Are you trying to submit a requisition? Are you trying to add a new vendor? And it sort of guides the person by like literally highlighting the area they need to click. And it's just things like that, that I feel, you know, it helps my team focus on the things that are going to, you know, bring better value to the company rather than, you know, sort of handholding people, um, you know, through these processes. And I think also just a lot of automations, looking at every single touch point that we're dealing with in the process and trying to automate that, even when it comes to like, you know, following up with people for approvals, like we set up a robot to do that. Like, you know, there's no more human interaction in the places that we can, we can eliminate it. So. Love it. What a throwback to the paper clip. I haven't like visualized that for, <laughs> I think a, a decade or two. So now I can't stop thinking about it. Wayne, what about you? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the first things we turn to is our partnerships, you know, including our incredible partnership with Vendor. Uh, we, this is a time when uh, we need that knowledge base and we need those extra hands. And um, it's not just in the SaaS space. Uh, you need to do the same, you know, with your brokers in real estate, with your 
providers and employee benefits, all of those spaces, um, you need to really reach out um, and see what they know about what's going out in the marketplace. Um, you know, we are definitely with the downturn driving towards, you know, as Michelle mentioned, creating transparency. So that's one of the major focuses we have is just, um, you know, after such fast growth, it's like, okay, here's everything we have and uh, here's the costs associated with it, you know, and, and it just gives us a chance to have those conversations and make sure we're in the right place with everything and spending it in the right places. Yeah, you know, it's neat. It's like hearing the these the three responses to this question. It almost sounds as if we're talking to like a, a product team, right? It's like the focus on the customer, and uh, I think that's really interesting because as you're building out procurement processes, you're keeping the customer in mind, and it sounds like you do like research on what can make their life easier, which by default then makes your life easier. And so the focus on transparency, for example, uh, super cool. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, we talked a lot about automation today, so I want to go a little bit deeper here. Um, automation, it's everywhere, and whether it exists in a SaaS tool or you build it yourself, um, as you're all creative procurement problem solvers, um, could you share ways that you've automated procurement within your organization? And like focusing on the tactics here, I think would be really helpful. Um, and to kick it off, why don't we start with Soren? Oh, thank you. Um, so in my view, automation can come along along very different uh, you know different paths so the path that i'm going to lay out is not going to be necessarily the path that uh works for you uh, or for for another company but uh what i my, my key insight is that automation ultimately is a journey not a destination and uh kind of the, the steps that i'm sharing with you we're not fully complete yet but i believe that when we get to you know kind of the, the step what I, that i'm outlining uh that we will most likely find you know, several other steps that uh, we want to automate. Um, so with that being said, uh, where we started at Commerce Hub um, <clears throat> less than a year ago um, was a uh, implementing workflow tool. Um, what that uh, drove, it uh, helped us standardize um, uh, our processes as I've mentioned uh, before, also create additional uh, visibility. Uh, in, a, uh, in that uh, workflow tool, we, we handle all approvals internal communication and all files uh, such as, you know, red line revision files and so forth, uh, or, or other decks that were shared, they're all in one place, uh, which eliminates a ton of email conversations and looking for for files. Um, we have, we, we've plucked in from the get go, um, other software, uh, like e-signature software, our ERP infosec reporting, uh, spend cube uh, data is being plugged in, uh, and also license uh, usage, uh, uh, we're going to start uh, plugging in as well. So uh, I see the workflow tool as a backbone that if my, my process works, I can then add additional pieces uh, that generally speaking create complexity to that uh, process uh, flow and make it very executable. Uh, the second step in our uh, in our automation journey is uh, the digitization of all contract data. So we're actively in the process of digitizing all the key fields from uh, from from contract all contracts. So expiration dates, auto renewal dates, spent data, and that kind of stuff. Um, that uh, will allow us uh, when we have it uploaded into a software management tool um, uh, to proactively uh, review um, the upcoming the cadence of upcoming renewals. And so instead of being like 30 days to 60 days out, well, our goal is to be 90 to 120 days out because time equals leverage. Um, so for us, that uh, that will allow us to be proactive. And then also we can then also then determine how we can flex our work towards um, tactical work uh, and, and strategic uh, efforts. Uh, so that way we can, we can lean in on the right stuff uh, a little bit harder. Um, third, and we're we're not there yet. We, you know, as I just mentioned, we're planning to upload uh, that digitized data into a, a software management, uh, like a, a management software tool. The goal there is, as I mentioned, to be proactive. And then uh, the next step that's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, not as well defined is we we plan on connecting even more tooling and software uh, into that evolving process, so that way we can then. Uh, uh, continue to, to leverage the efficiency of, of a well-defined and clear process to do more strategic work like SRM meetings uh, and, and uh, more strategic efforts uh, that are uh, driven by our leadership team. Very interesting. Um, Wayne, what about you? What have you leveraged that active campaign? 
So um, you we're definitely doing a number of things and have done a number of things, but I, I think it's important, you know, with when you're looking at automation, um, the first thing we actually did is just kind of step back and look at existing processes. And uh, you know, by leveraging sort of a Lean Six Sigma lens on everything, uh, we wanted first to identify, you know, where in the existing processes we had bottlenecks, where we had waste, um, and also just to know all the players that are interconnected. Um, if you have disparate teams working on automation, you know, inside and outside of procurement, uh, it can get a little crazy, um, pretty complex dance. But you know, we first, after we did those assessments, we first focused on um, contract lifecycle management. So that was one of the first things uh, we moved into um, uh, AP automation, and then you know, most recently, just about to launch uh, centralized spend request management. So. Um, those things are coming organically. We want to deploy them in a way that we don't impair any agility across the company. So that's difficult. It's a really uh, measured change management routine that we have to go through in education. Um, we're pretty small, so everybody wears a lot of hats. Um, so uh, we have to cover a lot of folks and a lot of topics. And we have to be really careful not to disrupt uh, existing workflows when we do that. But yeah. I, Automation is going to be key so that we can do as much as possible, uh, as fast as possible with the fewest heads. And, and Wayne, are there are there methods that you use to to track that? Like for for example, um, is it like NPS uh, from your internal users, or how do you know that you're you're not blocking others, or how do you know that these processes are are making people's lives easier? Yeah, right now it's just informal feedback. We haven't started formal surveying, but yeah, uh, you know. And just proactively asking after, during and after implementation to make sure uh, we get great feedback. Um, one thing that's awesome at Active Campaign is everybody's empowered to speak up. So if something's not right or it's going really well, we'll um, and we can adjust on the fly. Yeah, great. Michelle, what about you? What, what are you uh, doing at Datadog with regards to automation within the procurement organization? Yep. So. Um, earlier in the year, we actually sent out a survey to our internal stakeholders to get some feedback about how they felt about the process. Um, and uh, certainly probably could have prepared myself a little bit better for the feedback, but it was all it was all really good to see and to be honest with it that you know the processes really weren't going that well. So, you know, I think what came out of it was that procurement needed to be a little bit more, hands-on with some with certain things and less with other things. So kind of what I spoke about earlier that we needed to take a step away from these things that weren't really adding value. So like following up with people, um, you know, there were a lot of steps to even send a contract over to legal. So what we ended up doing was automating those comments that we follow up with people, nothing sits with people for too long. We automated the process of getting contracts over to legal, which is on, you know, a completely separate JIRA board. And then something that we're actually going through right now is an implementation for a vendor onboarding tool, which is more of a holistic approach to vendor onboarding. So we're trying to make some of those portions way more automated than they are now. So for example, there's certain documentation that we need to get from a vendor, um, you know, certain boilerplate language that they need to sign off on. And right now we have a procurement representative that I actually think is on this call right now. So um, she does an amazing job staying on top of everything and sending it out to all the new vendors, but obviously it's a time suck. So what we're trying to do is based on certain parameters and vendor types, we want to automate that process of sending those documents out to the vendors and gathering their signatures through this portal, rather than having somebody having to stay on top of that all the time. And, you know, another thing that we're doing is, you know, implementing a SaaS tool, which is huge because when we do the contract negotiations um, and we're planning for these software negotiations, there's a lot of heavy lifting that we need to do in the beginning, gathering all of the information from our internal stakeholders of, you know, how have these licenses grown over the past year? Um, how many people requested a license? What's the utilization? Have you been auditing, right? And it'd be really great if we could just have that in a dashboard, which, you know, we we do now and we're working on implementing that. So it's going to take, it's going to take a lot off of our plates and eliminate the need for, you know, a lot of um, conversations. We'll just have the information right there. Yeah. And Michelle, are there any methods that you use to, like, to, 
determine like what could be automated versus what can't because it sounds like you're looking for like tasks that are not worth the effort of of, yeah. of someone to do like that so they can focus time on more strategic things like how, how do you think about that I wish that I had a method that was better than this but a lot of it is just from conversations that I have with my team and when we have our team meetings and we're talking about you know something that I like to do is like you know if there was something that came up in you know an issue that came up in the previous week like let's all talk about it in a team meeting and try to figure out if there's a way that we can avoid it happening in the future and like a lot of the times it's really not a fault of anybody in the process. It's the fault of the process, right? The process is faulty, right? So we need to look at it and see how we can better, you know, better automate it, how we can, you know, completely eliminate procurement being involved in it um, or take more responsibility off of the stakeholder because they're not able to manage it either. So, you know, it's just, it's a lot of information gathering and, you know, luckily my team is awesome and they bring things up all the time because I always just try to push, push the agenda that nothing is written in stone here. I'm completely open and I want everybody to speak up and say when something isn't working or they feel it could be better. Love it. As my old boss used to say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Exactly. All right, great. We're going to do one more question. And then uh, we, it looks like we have a bunch uh, for the Q&A. So the final question, and Michelle, we'll keep it with you. We'll end with a thought provoker. Um, where do you think procurement is heading as an industry? And do you have any predictions for what 2023 will look like in the procurement field? Yeah, I mean, this, I think this really goes back to what I was kind of speaking about earlier about increasing transparency and kind of breaking down silos between internal stakeholders and internal, you know, departments. Somebody actually dropped a really great question in the Q&A um, that speaks to how procurement is involved in budgeting and the relationship that procurement has with FP&A. That's something that I'm currently working on right now that, believe it or not, was not really a fulfilling relationship up until very recently. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's something that we're working on. And I think that, I think that everybody in these different teams, they have really valuable information that could be so helpful to procurement and to other people too, but it's like nobody's sharing anything. Right. So I think again, it's just really going to be more so procurement having a seat at the table, procurement being more strategic rather than being seen as purchasing, right? Like a lot of the education that we have to do internally is what is the difference between purchasing and procurement? And I think that it's it's really gonna kind of head there, um, you know, as an industry. And obviously, you know, the, the economy is a huge, a huge battle um, right now and just being conservative with everything. So, you know, it's just being way more strategic than in the past. Purchasing versus procurement, yeah. dropping gems. I like it. <laughs> uh, Wayne, what about you? Yeah, I think for existing procurement teams, it's, it's going to be um, what Michelle said more, you know, just getting more invitations to, you know, to have a seat at the table, um, you know, so that we can have those strategy conversations. I think though in the startup arena specifically, I would just encourage those organizations, um, and I think they are, to start up their procurement function a little bit earlier. Um, you know, don't wait until things are out of control. Um, although I think, you know, all of us have experience coming in at that point um, in different organizations and, and it can be, the ship can be righted, but if you bring them in earlier, you're just going to get that value even earlier. You're going, you know, this is a function that oftentimes, you know, pays for itself year over year and beyond. So start early. Uh, it will keep everything well organized, build those relationships early, be at the table sooner to help guide strategic decisions. All those things are, are really good things and something that the procurement team wants to do. Yeah, it's funny. We talked earlier about like time is leverage for a deal, like for a negotiation. Well, time is leverage for a procurement department because the, the time it would require to, uh, required to clean up a mess versus actually set those processes from your know, early days, I, I would imagine leads to leads to a lot of scale um, or efficiencies. All right, Soren, what what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with with Wayne and Michelle around uh, kind of the procurement needing uh, to to continue to earn that seat at the table. Um, 
you know, but with that seat comes also greater responsibility. Um, and, and uh, you know, as many of us as procurement uh, uh, practitioners uh, know, um, you know, we'll, we'll want to engage our stakeholders in a most, uh, you know, on, on not just the, the buying, but also on the strategic decision-making, right? Um, and I, I believe, and this may not be, uh, maybe a little bit outside of left field, but I believe that uh, procurement uh, can drive actually a competitive advantage, um, uh, you know, for their respective uh, companies by structuring contracts that actually work and not hinder. Um, so, um, yeah. But that being said, I, I agree with uh, Wayne and Michelle. Terrific. All right, Gab, I'll pass it over to you. What, what, do we have some questions coming in on the live? Yeah. yeah. Wow. First of all, I just want to say I am so impressed with, I mean, I knew you three would just like bring the heat, but I think I can speak for all of the audience and uh, all of vendor. And that was a really great conversation. So, um, and we've still got more to go. We've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A queue. Um, so let's let's jump right in. If there's anything that jumps out to um, the three of you, feel free to come off of mute and um, and just grab it. But let's just start with the top one. Looks like uh, this person asked, in your negotiations with people of different backgrounds, how do you navigate the conflict that may naturally arise when negotiating with somebody who's different than you? Um, anybody want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I believe that's the name of the game. I mean, you, you always have conflicting interests, right? Um, internally, whether it's legal versus, let's say, your stakeholder, if it's marketing uh, versus IT, the, the, the bandwidth issues versus uh, kind of the supplier. Um, my approach is that I that I uh, is very simply put, I, I try to put myself in their shoes, right? What are they are what are they trying to solve, right? Uh, and then approach my communication with them around the problem they're trying to solve their problem, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> that oftentimes uh, allows me also to see the complexity of, of, of a um, given negotiation or of a conflict. Um, and usually that leads to leads me to be more open-minded um, and uh, comprehensive of the complexity of the solution. I think there's no downside to that. I love it. Thank you, Soren. Um, all right, we'll move on since we've got so many questions. We'll move on to the next one. Um, this question says, we've seen a lot of almost unpredictable changes to our work in personal lives in the last couple of years from the pandemic to the inflation. How did this impact the procurement function as you consider longer term contracts? How do you future proof contracts now? Wayne, you came on mute. Yeah, um, you know, it, this is always a problem. And, and, you know, the easier answer is, well, you, we, we do a lot of shorter term contracts, but even in the longer term ones, you know, don't forget the basics, uh, you know, bake in the limitation on renewal increases. Uh, I see that missed more often than I think it should be. Um, it's a really basic thing. Um, and it also, if you have that conversation saying, you know, we really need to limit and, you know, our next renewal to X percentage increase, um, it will identify anybody who's giving you sort of a teaser rate because they'll, you'll know uh, if they're really fighting that that increase cap. It's sort of an indicator that uh, you might have a surprise coming at renewal. Yep, absolutely. Go ahead, Michelle, you're about to say something. Yeah, something we've also done in our contracts is kind of um, adding in a stipulation that says if we are about to go over in our usage that we have the opportunity to renegotiate. So like a lot of the times it'll say that if you go over, you're just going to get charged X amount over the rate and you're kind of on the hook until the contract is up for renewal again. Um, but something we've definitely done in the past is kind of protect against that um, because what we've typically done because of how unpredictable things are, we've been rather conservative in projecting out our growth and our future need, you know, for licenses. So a lot of the time we do kind of get up right to that buffer and we do need to pre, you know, we do need to renegotiate. Um, so if we don't have pricing tiers already set up in the contract, we can be, you know, leaving ourselves open to, you know, rather high overage charges. So that's something that we've used in the past. Yeah, that's going to be so tough to find the balance between like making sure you're building in enough headcount, but not overpaying and then facing right. those fees later on. Yep. Um, Michelle, this might be a good one for you. I know you're, you're talking a lot about like the internal stakeholders. What are your, what are your methods for soliciting needs and wants from stakeholders across the business early um, yep. and often knowing what time is your best lever? Yeah. So, I mean, 
the thing that's hardest about this, I think, is the stuff that's new, right? So like the things that are coming up for renewal, it's really easy to reach out to everybody and decide what they want to do and the kind of how they envision the vendor relationship going moving forward. But the thing that is challenging is the new stuff. So actually a meeting that I just had this morning um, was about, again, collaborating with FPNA that has already has this really valuable information in front of them. And when they're actually doing the budget, a lot of the times they get that information up front of projects that these different departments are thinking about doing. So it gets it gets put in the budget and then we'll know up front, right? Then at least we can reinforce what the process is, whether it's going out to bid, whether it's, you know, just getting, you know, a couple of different uh, prices from various vendors, whatever it is, we get the opportunity to have that learning experience with them and make sure that people aren't going, you know, around the process or including us very late. Um, but hey, I'll be honest, this is something that is a work in progress for us. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, you know, spent the last three years kind of building the foundation of everything. And this is just sort of the next step in the evolution. So, you know, we've been thinking about surveys out to people, getting an idea on a quarterly basis, what they're thinking about doing and kind of trying to, you know, shed light on the unknown. Absolutely. Soren, you came off of mute. Did you have something yeah, to add there? I, I'm a big believer in uh, early discovery. Uh, and by early discovery, uh, I mean that when whether it's a new deal or, a renewal, I uh, like to schedule usually just a 15 to 30 minute call with the internal stakeholder or stakeholders, uh, depending on uh, kind of what product it is, just to hear them out, how, you know, if it's a renewal, how things are going, uh, what's not working, what's not working, uh, pain points, uh, future uses, usage goals, and that kind of stuff. So that I get a, get a really good understanding of how the user is thinking about that upcoming renewal or a new uh, uh, solution, whether we've picked one or or we've identified uh, a handful of potential providers. I also uh, get on a call with uh, with the providers for 30 minutes uh, just to understand um, how they're pitching the product, how they're wanting to sell it, how licensing works and that kind of stuff so that I become conversant on on their side of the of the equation as well. That's it feels like a you know, kind of intense type time in, uh, investment at the front end, but you know those thirty to sixty minutes of time investment save hours down the path uh, in lead conversations and in finance conversations. Just because I'm simply, I can articulate different points of view, uh, views uh, a lot more, uh, uh, a lot better, and I teach that that type of approach uh, to uh, to to my team um, um, and have done that over the years. And I think it's a, it's the best practice. I love that. I feel like plus when you have all the information, you have a lot more control over the negotiation too. Yeah, the more um, I know, the, the, the yeah, the, the better I can uh, think about what, how do I uh, kind of position myself in that negotiation. Yes, of course. Um, all right, the next question I think we already answered is anybody, um, unless anybody wants to add to it, um, are you and should procurement be involved in budgeting? Wayne, you're nodding your head. Did you want to jump in there? Yeah, just, I mean, briefly, yes and yes. Um, and, and, you know, certainly not in the allocation of the total dollars that a team should get. But um, when you get down to the category level and certainly at the individual vendor or product level in a budget, we have a lot of insight uh, in utilization, in, in, like I said, contract caps and things like that. I've lived in past lives where there's a sort of a paintbrush approach where we just increase everything over some cost, you know, or inflation index. And it's like, oh, no, 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 wait there's actually some dips coming let's let's release those funds to be budgeted somewhere else great awesome thank you um all right and uh, i wonder if a sales rep wrote this question what should sales reps know about procurement so that both sides get the best deal um sorry that got that got you going pretty well do you have an answer to that one? <laughs> oh, I, I actually i don't um <laughs> Uh, what the sales rep should know is that you don't want to give uh, the secret we, sauce. <laughs> we no no no. It, I I don't think that's the secret sauce. I, what the sales rep should know is uh, that we're competitively uh, looking at all of our options, right? Uh, but that's obviously uh, you know also not always the case. Um, I think uh, you know my my earlier answer to uh, focusing on solutions uh, for existing problems is key. Uh, and if both sides take that approach uh, around pr understanding. What problems we're trying to solve and what there's what the potential solution is both sides can get creative on the deal structure uh, that ultimately 
uh, the deal is as flexible as I would like it to be. For instance, if I'm if I'm uh, kind of in the purchasing on the purchasing side of the equation, and uh, they get uh, you know that the, the seller of their solutions also gets gets out of. Uh, that relationship, what they need. And sometimes that means PR rights. Sometimes that doesn't mean that, uh, that there's some flexibility around how we, if we don't know exactly how extensive the usage may increase and some create, create, creative ways of being able to step up usage without a commensurate increase in cost and that kind of stuff. I think uh, problem solving from both sides instead of just selling in um, uh, from a sales side or, or just uh, wanting to hammer down the price from a buying side, I think is key. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I'm hearing is really like not thinking of it as like one side versus the other, but like how can we work collaboratively to get this, to get this deal done, which I feel like Ryan is why, you know, you, why you started vendor, um, right? Like the impetus for this all is like, how can we just, this is, we, we don't have to be battling every yeah. time we go up against each other. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one thing to that. I mean, I think, so I, I, my background is in software sales and one of the best ways that I've now learned to navigate procurement because of working with people like you is that just ask and you treat it like you would qualify someone like a prospect. And, you know, the best salespeople are really good at qualifying before they spend time with someone. They want to understand, is this person a good fit for my product? Should they even buy this product? Can they afford this product? And what's the process to buying this product? And I think those are all really fair questions to ask procurement because procurement's job is not to slow things down. Procurement's job is to ensure that their internal stakeholders get the products they need when they need them at a fair price and, and also accommodating for risk. And so really qualifying what the procurement team is trying to solve. From my experience, you, procurement feels very nice. They actually will open up with, with what they need. And then it's up to the salesperson. Do you want to accommodate or do you not? I love it. Michelle? I'll add one thing to that. And I swear I'm not being cute by saying this, but <laughs> I feel like um, sales reps need to know that we don't believe um, that a price is suddenly going to go up if we don't sign it by a certain date. And we also know when you're pressuring us that it's just that you want to close out for yourself to get your commission and not, it has nothing to do with this arbitrary increase in pricing or, you know, whatever. And it's, it's frankly, I think this is a bad move on sales reps part because I feel like you show your hand when you start like pressuring like that. And I think that procurement folks are a little bit more savvy than that in negotiation. Um, you know, I think that you probably get away doing that to somebody that isn't a procurement, um, you know, special uh, specialist, but you can't really do it to somebody that, you know, has, has dealt with this a long time. So it's one thing that drives me nuts. It drives our CFO nuts also. I could never even go to him and say, hey, could you look at this today? Because they're going to increase our pricing tomorrow. He would purposely not look at it. So <laughs> just a piece of advice. I think we need an entire uh, V2 of this presentation with this group just on how salespeople can navigate procurement. Yeah, I actually, I sit down with the internal data dog sales teams and the customer success teams pretty often, um, you know, kind of just pulling the curtain back on procurement and, you know, asking questions that they would normally not get the answer to. So that's great. Your knowledge can really be extended in all directions, not just uh, to, but the buy side. Awesome. Um, all right. So the next question is, um, do your teams follow any special process when evaluating software with evidence of strong demand from bottoms up adoption across the organization? Um, does anyone feel like they want to answer that one? trying to process it myself. Soren, you came off. I don't think there's a special process. Um, I mean, if that's the case, there's a bit of a groundswell and uh, that may just be one of those things that we just have to get creative on how we maintain leverage from a procurement perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing I'll, else I'll reframe that one then. Soren, and, and for Wayne and Michelle as well, like, is there a, I guess, materiality threshold? Because a lot of these you know, product-led growth or freemium products, you know, they'll be used by your users, but the cost is like below potentially your threshold. When does it get on your radar for some of these bottom-up adopted products? Well, we have different approval uh, uh, lever, uh, lever, uh, kind of levels, um, and they vary, will vary by company, uh, and no surprise here. So we have uh, an approval uh, level where a finance will need to approve. And then if it goes over a certain threshold, then it, it bubbles up to the CFO. Uh, and uh, the review process, you know, at that level obviously is a lot more intense. Um, 
and then the question is always are we just adding in one more tool right so that's where where then where it gets tricky of like if there's tool overlap then we want to come prepared with an answer it's like hey if we take this tool how are we going to wind down the other tool right so we need to bring the answers around how we offboard uh, an, a, another solution great Wayne, were you about to jump in too? Yeah, I was just gonna add, you know, we do ask that even if it's one license, they come through our team, but it's not to negotiate it or to hold it up. It's just like Soren was saying, it's for awareness. Um, you know, we wanna make the best employee experience possible. So we've been fairly flexible at getting, you know, whatever tools people need. Um, but when it set, starts to reach a critical mass, when you start to see a title crossing several different user departments, that's when we need to pull up and and, and Put in a more formal negotiation process in a enterprise level contract. Cool, awesome, thank you. All right, the next question is: uh, If a company is looking to hire their first procurement leader, what should they look for? I think somebody that is scrappy, self sufficient, somebody that can kind of set out on this sort of like expedition on their own, right? Like you don't really need to, you can't really have a person that like you need to breathe down their neck for them to get anything done. And I think that also a person that's like rather agile and that understands a delicate balance between knowing when to put their foot down, but also when to kind of mold it to the culture of the company, right? And like, you also don't want somebody that's gonna come in and like steamroll the whole thing. And then none of the internal stakeholders are going to trust them or wanna work with them. So I think a lot of it, you know, it's it's knowing how to put a process in place. And then as time goes on, just continue to refine it um, over time. So it's not such a great shock to the company and the internal stakeholders, you know, if you look at the process that I put in place, which still, you know, this is not me patting myself on the back, like it still has a ton of, ton of work to be done on it, right? It still has a ton of room for improvement. But if you look at the difference of what it was, you know, a year into me being here two years, and then today, it's all very different. And it's kind of tightened up since that first initial implementation of say, you know, our procurement system, for example. So just somebody that can kind of get along with people, but also nicely, you know, put their foot down and be strong. Awesome. Thank you. Wayne, were you going to add something? Yeah, I think you just need someone who rocks working in the gray. Um, I think when you hire that first person, the companies acknowledge that there's a need for a procurement organization, but they don't necessarily know what that looks like or, or you know, what shape that's going to take and so you're not the first person in may not get you know really clear guidance um and so you just need somebody who you know is awesome at change management but is also really comfortable being a change instigator um and and knows um like michelle was saying knows when <laughs> to do that and when not to do that and, and how to how to do that communication very tactfully Love it. Great. Um, a lot of hard skills and soft skills mixed together in this like unicorn profile. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, it looks like we're, um, we've got four minutes left. Uh, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Um, just looking through these questions. I think we kind of just answered the question about tackling the very first thing we tackle when starting. Well, we talked about the best profile for a procurement team um leader but what about what's the very first thing you tackle when starting a procurement team you want to have yeah if i having had started up a couple of a couple of times procurement teams or or revamp them it's always a needs analysis right um a kind of like root you know what's broken what's working what's broken what do we what do the current uh, processes look like it's just getting an understanding of uh the lay of the land professionally um not pointing fingers, just learning um, and understanding and then uh, thinking about 80-20, right? You won't fix everything, right? That, you know, I think Michelle is very uh, uh, well articulated her kind of, uh, you know, the, the journey she has taken at Datadog, uh, but, uh, you know, figuring out what what's the, if I fix this, what's going to give me the most, uh, the most benefit and what's that next step, uh, kind of like a product journey, right? Where you, you uh, identify your uh, uh, your your most valuable uh, chip you need to you need to work on, 
um, and then you then you get going, and then you know you, you'll discover more things. But uh, kind of focusing on the few that drive the many is, I think, is key uh, with a good uh, with a good uh, uh, kind of assets analysis. Amazing. Um, well, I think with just a uh, two minutes left, or maybe less than two minutes, we'll we'll close things down here. But um, I just want to say I really appreciate um these impressive panelists uh thank you michelle thank you soren thank you wayne um and thanks to our our fearless leader ryan taking the time to host today um appreciate everybody joining live um and we'll definitely share out the recording after and we're going to be doing a lot more of these so um, maybe we'll have you three back for round two um but uh also want to um include lots more thought leaders in the space so um appreciate it and uh, hope everyone has a great day thanks everybody Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Wayne. Thank, thanks, Soren. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Take care, everybody.